Have you ever been in a situation where you were sure you were the smartest person in the room until you weren't? I don't know about you, but I have far more illustrations of that than we would ever have time to recount this morning. So in keeping with our church's annual theme of being careful how we build, here's one from the beginning of my construction career. I think I was four years old, and my dad and my grandpa were building a shed out in the backyard, and they were working on the foundation system. So they were carrying concrete blocks, and of course, I wanted to help. And my dad told me not to do it because they were too heavy. But surely at four years old, I was smarter than my dad. Then my grandpa chimed in and he said, and I quote, when you drop that on your foot, don't cry. (laughs) And I'm not saying that was the best comment for a grandpa to make, and I'm frankly trying to work all this out in therapy. But... but (laughs) I was um, obviously a lot smarter than my grandpa. I I was the smartest person in the room. Technically, I was the smartest person in the backyard. Now, is there anybody here who had any doubt in their mind about what happened next? (laughs) Right on the old foot. It's amazing how quickly the tables can turn, you know? You go from being the, the smartest person in the room to wishing that you had listened because now you have a really sore foot and you can't do anything to help with the project the rest of the day. I wish I could tell you that was the last time I made that mistake. But there have been far too many times where what I thought was wise turned out to be foolish. And what I thought was foolish turned out to be wise. And the haunting reality is that the Apostle Paul says it's possible to do that with the cross of Jesus Christ. With that in mind, let me invite you to open your Bible this morning to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that's on page 130 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you if you need that this morning. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1 or page 130 of the back section of the Bible under the chair in front of you. Probably half of the pastors on the planet are going to be talking about this subject today because it's highly unusual for Easter to fall on April 1st. By the way, one of my sisters explained to me that when that happens, you're supposed to send your kids out for an Easter egg hunt, and when they come back an hour later reporting that they couldn't find anything, (laughs) just tell them April Fool's. Now, now... Now you can tell why I'm not quite right in the head, (laughs) right, between dropping blocks on my appendages and sibling advice like that. I mean, no wonder, just just no wonder. But the the, the passage before us is very serious, very serious. The church at Corinth had a myriad of problems. That's why it's such an interesting and helpful book. It's, It's all here. It's all here in this book. The number of practical issues that are discussed here is just incredible because Well, the Corinthians needed help in everything. They just needed help in everything. So after a very quick introduction, Paul dives right in in verse 11. He says, For for I've been informed concerning you, my brethren, by Chloe's people, that there are are quarrels among you. (laughs) Nothing like warming up to the topic slowly, huh? This isn't a crock pot. This is a microwave. And he goes on to explain that these various divisions in the church were were organizing themselves around different church leaders. So some were saying, well, I'm of Paul. Others were saying, I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas, Peter, I'm of of Christ. In other words, my teacher is smarter than your teacher, which makes me smarter than you. Therefore, I'm the smartest person in the room. Well, we all know where that leads, right? To a very sore foot. Let's read on, 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 18. Paul says, For the wisdom of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe, like the three men and women who indicated down at the long center the last couple of days that they were placing their faith and trust in Christ to save those who believe. Verse 22, for indeed, Jews ask for signs and and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen, the things that are not, so that, notice the purpose, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and, notice this, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We're talking this morning about the wisdom of the cross, and with the time we have remaining, let's just walk our way through these verses and look for three lessons to help us grow in wisdom God's way. First of all, understand the essential question. Everybody has to decide, whose wisdom are you going to follow? Now, why was that important to the Corinthians? Well, we're told the Greeks had as many as 50 different philosophical parties or systems. Each one had its own view of the meaning of life, a view of relationships and purpose and destiny and interaction with the gods. The word philosophy literally means love of wisdom. That's why Paul said in verse 22, indeed, Jews ask for signs, but Greeks, they search for wisdom. Well, what's the problem with that, at least potentially? If you don't have a reliable source, then your search doesn't lead to consensus. It's not like over time more people are going to agree that everything is the same as true, doesn't lead to consensus, it leads to proliferation. More and more theories, more and more ideas. That's why Paul explained to Timothy that human beings are always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So it doesn't matter if you have more people talking. That's like lining up 54-year-olds to build the storage shed in my dad's backyard. That doesn't get you to a better building. It gets you more sore feet. See, see, whose wisdom are you going to follow? Now, to push it one step further, if you choose, well, my source of wisdom is not going to be the Lord, here's what God says about that. My thoughts are not your thoughts, and nor are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. That's what Paul is trying to help the Corinthians understand. Wisdom comes through defining life and answering questions through the lens of God's Word. The psalmist said it like this, you you thought I was like you. And in case it's not clear, that's not a compliment. It's the difference between trying to make God into our image and calling that wisdom or allowing Him to remake us into His Whose wisdom are you going to follow? Well, why does that matter to you? Why does it matter to me? This conversation goes pretty quickly from building a shed to building a life. And Solomon affirmed this, there is a way which seems right to a man. I'm the smartest person in the room. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You can be absolutely convinced that you're right while simultaneously choosing a path that leads to destruction. See, just because your GPS says turn right doesn't mean you're not about to drive off a cliff, at which time your GPS will tell you, recalculating. (laughs) 
For example, we've had people who attended our Passion Play or who will be in one of our services this weekend, and they're convinced that what determines whether a person goes to heaven is their works. And so they have concluded in their mind, there's a way that seems right unto a man. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I try to be kind to others. I'm a whole lot better than my neighbor down the street and a whole lot better than Uncle Bob, whom I'm about to spend the afternoon with. And so the way it works is God's going to have some sort of heavenly scales and he's going to weigh my good and weigh my bad and my good will outweigh my bad and that's how I'm going to enter heaven. And that kind of thing sounds fine, I suppose, until you open the first page of the Bible and learn that that approach is nothing like the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then a person has to decide whose wisdom are you going to follow, that there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. It's true in all sorts of practical areas of everyday life. So you have some sort of a, a disagreement with one of your friends, and our culture suggests, well, you ought to do this, you ought, you ought to get even, or you ought to cut that person off or whatever. But the Word of God suggests the pathway that's entirely different, no? Communicate, try to solve problems, be quick to forgive, et cetera, et cetera. An approach that many in our world would say is foolish. They would say, well, that's, that's moronic to do that. See, whose wisdom are you going to follow? Whose wisdom are you going to follow when you try to decide, are you going to remain single or pursue marriage? Whose wisdom are you going to follow as you try to solve conflicts in your marriage or as you try to raise your kids or as you navigate challenges in the workplace or you face temptation and trial? Whose wisdom are you going to follow? And the reason this is so important is because the consequences are so significant. We, we saw that in Proverbs 14, 12. Did you know that exact same verse is repeated again in Proverbs 16, 25? There's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I wonder why one of the wisest persons who ever walked the earth, King Solomon, thought people like you and me needed to hear that twice. The consequences here potentially are significant. There's a heaven to be gained and a hell to be shunned. And the lie of the devil is you're so smart, you can choose your own way, and the end result is actually a richer life. Right, the polar opposite of what these verses are affirming. See, what did he say to Eve? You won't surely die. God's trying to withhold something from you. Your way is better. You won't surely die. So in their minds, they deem God's commands and God's counsel as being foolish, as being moronic, as being needlessly restrictive. And what happens next? When the woman saw that the tree was desirable to what? You can think you're the smartest person in the garden. Desirable to make one wise. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And what immediately began happening? They began dying. You realize death in the Bible is always separation. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. So they hid from God. You remember that? And, and they covered themselves up because of their guilt and their shame for the very first time. What was happening? Their relationship with God was dying. And then there's the first recorded marital spat in the Bible where God asks Adam what he did and what did he say in response? Let me blame it on my wife. Wait a man up, Adam. See what's happening. Their marriage is dying. They're dropping multiple concrete blocks on their feet. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And in the next chapter, one of their sons does what? Kills his brother. There's a way that seems right unto a man. By the end of Genesis chapter 4, you have what may be the first recorded song in the Bible celebrating what? Senseless murder. Lamech says to his wives, Ada and Zillah, listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech, give heed to my speech, for I've killed a man for wounding me. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the 
end thereof is the way of death. A boy for striking me, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Generation after generation, believing they're the smartest people in the room. Which is why James said, but each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. I'm the smartest person in the room. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's accomplished, brings forth death. There's a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. See, that's the question before the house this morning on April Fool's Day. Whose wisdom are you going to follow? And this question can lead to great hope. Oh, I realize you might say, "I'm I'm not feeling particularly hopeful right about now. Well, why is this information in the book of 1 Corinthians? Is God some sort of aloof deity mocking us for our foolishness? No, don't, don't, don't miss this. He's inviting us to turn around. Biblically, we call that repentance. He's inviting us to go a different way. And here's what you find at the end of that road. The law of the Lord, Psalm 19, 7, is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, doing what? And making wise the simple. It's possible for people like you and me to grow in biblical wisdom if we select our source of truth and knowledge carefully. I'm in my 31st year at faith. And that means as a pastor, I've had the joy of watching God grow men and women into wise and productive people and church members in ways that are just absolutely delicious. And I could give hundreds and hundreds of examples of that. It's just been a delight to to watch the Lord do that. Somebody I was thinking about the other day was Leona Smith, Doc Smith's wife, And the reason I thought about her might surprise you. It's a couple weeks ago when the stock market was behaving erratically, if you pay any attention to that at all. And I asked myself, I wonder what Mrs. Smith would say about this. And you might say, why why would you have thought that? Well, you may not know this, but she was very wise in investing. In fact, I can remember many times people, even like our former pastor, Pastor Good, going to her for investment advice because of her wisdom. Well, If you know her story, you know that she made all sorts of decisions over the course of her life that many would have thought were foolish. For example, she decided to admit her sin and place her faith and trust in the price that a a Jewish man paid on a wooden cross nearly 2,000 years ago as her hope of eternal life, as her hope of being reconciled to a holy God. I understand many would call that foolish, Then she and her husband volunteered for missionary service, but they were unable to go. And instead of becoming bitter about that, they began faithfully serving in their local church up in Lowell. And some would recall, or some would call a response to a disappointment like that as being foolish. Then our former senior pastor, Pastor Good, asked Doc and Leona to leave their established medical practice up in Lowell moved to Lafayette to help him start a faith-based community counseling ministry. And many would have just looked at the nuances of that decision and thought, that's just, that's moronic to do that. Then Mrs. Smith was asked to serve as the temporary counseling center secretary, a position she held for 20 years. Doc Smith would be the first person to tell you that there would be no way he could have accomplished a ministry that eventually spanned the globe without the love and the support and the wisdom and the counsel of his dear wife. And when she died, she had been married for nearly 64 years, had a wonderful family of four children and seven grandchildren and four great-grandchildren, and among the many, many ways she served was when the pastors needed advice about the movement of the stock market, they quietly sought her wisdom. So who's the wise one now? That's what Paul meant when he said, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen and the things that are not so that he may nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. 
And Mrs. Smith would have been the first one to say, I, I don't really view myself as being wise, which might be one of the first marks of genuine wisdom. But she would have also said this, to whatever degree that is true, it's because I allowed God's wisdom to become my own. I wanted his thoughts to become my thoughts. I wanted his ways to become my ways. I trusted him to make wise the simple. See, whose wisdom are you following? Now, let's dive a bit deeper into the argument of this passage. Consider reasons to embrace God's wisdom. See, see what would have been a, a smarter play for me in our backyard over 50 years ago? Right? Instead of picking up the block, maybe I should have sat down on the block and crossed my chubby little legs and considered whether there were any reasons to conclude that maybe what my dad thinks about this and maybe what my grandfather thinks about this is smarter than my view. See, that's what Paul is doing here. And consider the superiority of the wisdom of God. Why? Well, it's permanent. And Paul acknowledges in verse 18 that, that some view the word of the cross as foolishness. Crucifixion was a vile way to die. It wasn't even to be mentioned in polite company. So, so the notion that the Son of God would actually die in that way and that our salvation could be secured by trusting in such a vulgar act was considered by the world to be foolishness. The Greek word Mariah, from which we obviously get our word moronic, have you ever noticed, by the way, that one of the word groups that foolish people use most often is fool and foolish and foolishness? And of course, when they use it, they're talking about someone other than themselves. We saw a rather stark example of that recently when a well-known daytime talk show host suggested that our vice president was mentally ill because of his religious beliefs. But did you also notice the way such persons are described? The word of the cross is foolishness to whom? To those who are perishing. There's a haunting word, huh? Apoluminoi. Perishing. Are you embracing an approach to wisdom that is impermanent? One example of this dynamic is the contrast between Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis. If you've not read this book, I want to strongly encourage you to do so. It's called The Question of God. It's written by Armin Nicoli, who was a professor at Harvard Medical School. This has also been made into a PBS special. There's a lot of, if you Google this after church, um, you'll see there's a lot of, of resources about this particular um, Resource is very, very helpful. Nikolai set up a theoretical debate between Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis on the notion that Freud was one of the most influential thinkers and spokesmen for the secular or scientific worldview in the 20th century, and C.S. Lewis was one of the most influential thinkers and spokesmen for a spiritual or a Christian worldview during that same period of time. And what he did, and he took a lot of information that had previously been unpublished, and he just puts original source quotes. Here's what Freud said about this. Here's what Lewis said. Here's what Lewis said about that. Here's what Freud said. He just allows you to, to compare them in their original writings, some of them unpublished, and just says, whose wisdom are you going to follow? For example, Sigmund Freud believed that scientific work is the only road which can lead to a knowledge of reality. Really. He also said it would be an undoubted advantage if we were to leave God out altogether. Really. It would be an undoubted advantage if we were to leave God out altogether and honestly admit the purely human origin of the regulations and precepts of society, of civilization. So Sigmund Freud established a rival philosophy of life in direct competition to the Christian faith. If you read, and I would encourage you to read this book, one of the ways that Sigmund Freud loved to refer to himself in his letters to friends was that he was the God-hating Jew. I didn't say that about him. He used to love to say that about himself. And Freud, who took the position that all actions are symbolic 
on all of the days of the calendar that he could have chosen to launch his counseling center on purpose. Do you know what day he chose? Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday, because he saw his wisdom, he saw his approach to life as being in direct competition to the Christian faith. See, for him, the word of the cross was moronic. The word of the cross, by the way, prophesied hundreds of years in passages like the ones that we currently saw, or, or formerly saw in our worship time, Isaiah 53 as an example. The word of the cross that's affirmed by hundreds of eyewitnesses in the New Testament, Sigmund Freud thought all of that was foolishness. Well, what was Freud's problem? He was perishing. He was impermanent. And many scholars suggest that nobody believes Freud's theories today. They've all been entirely debunked. And what did Paul say about that? For it's written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. See, be careful whose wisdom you are following. And that person might act like they're the smartest person in the room until they're not. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Impermanent. Compare that to the bestseller of all times. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God, it does what? Stands forever. So what I'm saying to every person who's going to hear this message today, when you consider whose wisdom to embrace, give careful attention to the issue of permanence. It's also redemptive. Paul said, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. By God's grace, we've seen a number of persons already this weekend at the Passion Play admit their need and place their faith and trust in Christ as a result of following the wisdom of the Word of God, the wisdom of the cross, saves those who believe. One of the most important tests of any person's worldview is the answers it has for life and death. If you know anything about Sigmund Freud, you know that he frequently dreamed about death. How'd you sleep last night, Sigmund? <laughs> Not so well. In fact, his own personal physician described his preoccupation with death as being superstitious and obsessive. That's what his friend said. He was constantly predicting when and how he would die. For example, at age 38, in one of his letters, he said this, I'm going to go on suffering from various complaints for another four to five to eight years. I have no idea where that math came from, four to five to eight. You skipped a few. With good and bad periods, and then between 40 and 50, perish very abruptly from a rupture of heart. He hated birthdays. In fact, he lived longer than that. So here's what he said on his 60th birthday. If I had known how little joy I would have on my 60th birthday, my first would probably not have given me pleasure either. <laughs> Happy birthday to you too, dude. It would be, in the best of times, only a melancholic celebration. That from the man who believed it would be an undoubted advantage to leave God out altogether. By the way, do you know how Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychology, do you know how he died? You should. He died a lonely, bitter, depressed man who committed suicide. He made his personal physician keep his promise to euthanize him with high and repeated doses of morphine. Yet that is someone who considered the cross of Jesus Christ to be moronic. What about C.S. Lewis, a man who lived at the exact same period of time and who espoused a spiritual or a Christian philosophy of life? Do you know how he died? And I understand that we have some members of our church who have fresh experiences of loved ones who passed away. And I'm not in any way minimizing the grief and the pain that you might be experiencing, but I want to tell you this story because it's what occurred in history and it makes a very, very important point. C.S. Lewis was in a coma and he almost died. But then he came back to life and here's what he said to a friend about that. 
He said, I was unexpectedly revived from a long coma, and perhaps the almost continuous prayers of my friends did it. But it would have been a luxuriously easy passage, and one almost regrets having the door shut in one's face. Then he said to his friend, when you die, look me up. It's all rather fun. Solemn fun, isn't it? See, who's the smartest person in the room? Whose world and life view has an answer for life and death? Listen to these next two quotes, one from Freud and one from Lewis, and then just answer, whose wisdom would you rather follow? Freud said, obscure, unfeeling, and unloving powers determine men's fate. Lewis said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. One of these men was saved. One of them was lost. Is there any question in your mind which was which? See, God's wisdom is permanent, and God's wisdom is redemptive, and God's word also is powerful. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God. I was quite serious when I said a moment ago, as you watched our worship team leading us in worship, many men and women who have served to the point of exhaustion in our passion play and still have the kind of exuberance that they would demonstrate before the Lord this morning, what is that? That's the power of God. That's the power of God working in and through our church family. And can I just pause and ask you a question this morning? personally now, whose wisdom are you following? That's what it comes down to. Whose wisdom are you following? First, regarding your salvation, is it possible that you have come into this service this morning believing that, well, I have a personal relationship with God because of my own goodness? I've earned it. God's going to have some sort of heavenly scales, and He's going to weigh out the good and the bad and all that sort of thing. Well, friend, then why did there have to be a cross? And why did Jesus have to die? And I know, I know it's hard for us to admit that what we previously thought might be incorrect. But, but do you realize this? There's a lot more at stake here than a sore foot. There's a heaven to be gained. And there is a hell to be shunned. And I recognize the cross may appear foolish to some. It may appear weak to others because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And I would invite you this morning right here, right now to turn around. If you believe that you were able to earn your own salvation by your merit and your goodness, I would urge you to turn around. I would urge you to acknowledge your sin. And I know that it's hard for us as proud Americans to do that. But I would urge you to acknowledge your sin, acknowledge that your sin has separated you from a holy God, and then run, not walk to the cross. Run, not walk to the empty tomb. And place your faith and trust in the resurrected Savior while you have the opportunity to do so. Christian friend, what about the, the way that you live each and every day? What about embracing the wisdom of the cross in the way that you live? See, the way the Corinthians would stop arguing with one another in this divisive fashion and overcome all the other sinful habits that are discussed in this book is to learn to embrace the beauty and the glory of the cross in the power of the resurrection each and every day. And so, yeah, maybe you're having a disagreement with a friend, but you decide to follow God's wisdom regardless of how you feel, regardless of what the culture might say, you decide to follow God's wisdom, and so you communicate biblically and try to solve the problem, and you're quick and ready to forgive if necessary and to restore that relationship and continue to move forward. And I realize the world might say you're being foolish for not seeking revenge or for not cutting that person off or for not becoming angry or bitter, whatever it is. But for us who are being saved, that approaches the, the power of God. Or sure, you're following biblical principles in your marriage regarding the role of the husband and the role of the wife or the way you're relating to your children in the home, etc., etc. 
And I recognize that you may be having Easter lunch in just a little bit with extended family members or friends who would view all of that as being foolish, as being moronic. That's what they might say about it. Well, for us who are being saved, it is the, the power of God. And I would just say this as an old pastor about those two paths. Just sit back and watch where those paths lead. To us who are being saved, the word of the cross is the power of God. Whose wisdom are you going to follow? Well, where does all this take us? The answer is it takes us to a celebration. A celebration of what? Celebrate the opportunity to glory only in the Lord. See, see, when you don't think you're the smartest person in the room, you don't have to spend enormous amounts of time and energy trying to convince everybody else that you are, which leaves bandwidth for what? For glorifying our crucified risen king. Verse 29, look at the henna clauses, the purpose clauses, so that no man may boast before God. Or verse 31, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. See, there's a delightful humility that results in all of this. And by the way, I think this has to be said. That doesn't mean like that a church like ours or any other biblical church doesn't have some really intelligent or powerful or accomplished people. It's just that that's not our focus. Right? I mean, who cares about that because our glory is in the Lord? As I was preparing this message, one of the persons that came to mind was Kevitt Brown. Kevitt was one of the dear deacons in this church. He passed away after an extended bout with cancer. Kevitt's wife, Sarah, is still a member here. One of their da daughters, Tirza, is married to one of our pastors, Aaron Burke. Kevitt and Sarah and their family were known as people of prayer. They, they often led the various prayer initiatives of our church because they wanted us to humbly go before the Lord. They also led various aspects of our international ministries because they wanted us to relate to those of other ethnicities with humility and with grace. He was also an incredibly kind man. Some of you over the years had the privilege of having Kevin as your deacon. You, you were on his deacon's care group and you know he was just unbelievably kind. He was also an amazing evangelist. One of the last times I saw Kevin alive, it was down at um, one of the hospitals in Indianapolis, and his cancer was really bad by that point. And I think it was Joe Blake and I went down to visit Kevin, and we just were trying to get an update on his condition. He wasn't having any of that. He really wasn't that interested in talking about his condition. What he wanted to talk about was um, he had a friend who was Hispanic, and he was trying to set up an appointment with this man so that they could study the Bible because neither of them were sure that this man knew the Lord. So, Kevin, how's your condition? I don't know, but I got to get out of here. Kevin, how are you feeling? I don't know, but I, I need to schedule this appointment with this man. Can you help me schedule this appointment with this man? I'm not sure he knows the Lord, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was Kevin Brum. Well, it wasn't until I was preparing Kevitt's funeral that I learned some things about his academic and professional accomplishments I never knew before. I'd been with him in meetings and meetings for years and years and years. I never knew this. He, he received his PhD from Cornell. You realize they don't give those out in a box of Cracker Jacks. He was an accomplished geneticist who held several patents in his field. I never knew any of that. Why? Because Kevitt never gloried in that kind of stuff. Because he gloried in the cross. It's like Jeremiah said, thus says the Lord, let not a wise man boast of his wisdom, or let not the mighty man boast of his might, let not a rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth, for I delight in these things, says the Lord. Paul concludes this discussion by saying, but by his doing, you're in Christ Jesus. Now listen to the argument. Who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness, that's where this leads, and sanctification and redemption. In other words, the wisdom of the cross over time produces delightful personal holiness. 
a moment ago I mentioned the difference between Sigmund Freud and C.S. Lewis, a, a very stark contrast, I think, between a life built on the wisdom of man and another built on the wisdom of God. And I've been asking you all morning to think about whose path would you rather be on. Well, in closing, let me remind you of a couple of other deaths of cultural leaders that have taken place in the last year or so. The death of Hugh Hefner and Billy Graham. Ross Douthat wrote in the New York Times about Hefner. He said, the arc of his life vindicated his moral critics, conservative and feminist. What began with talk of jazz and Picasso and other signifiers of good taste ended in a sleazy decrepitude that would have been pitiable if it wasn't still so exploitative. Early half had a pipe and a suit and a highbrow reference for every occasion. He even claimed to have a philosophy, that final refuge of the scoundrel. But late, late half was a lecherous, lowbrow Peter Pan playing at perpetual boyhood, ice cream for breakfast, pajamas all day, while bodyguards shooed male celebrities away from his paid harem and the skull grinned beneath his papery skin. Contrast that to Billy Graham, who may have been used of God to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to more men and women than any other human being who ever lived, but who did so with grace and humility and high moral character. And I would just ask you this morning, who was wise and who was foolish? And whose path would you rather be on? Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for being honest with us about our foolishness. And we don't really like to hear about it, but um, for those of us who have lived long enough to see the effects of being on a foolish road, we certainly believe it's helpful. And Father, right now, I pray that each one of us on Easter Sunday, on April Fool's Day, would think long and hard about this question of whose wisdom we're really following. And I would pray, first of all, for any person who's here who their wisdom has been that their goodness is enough to earn a relationship with you. And Father, I pray that such a person in the quietness of this moment would repent. And I pray that they would turn to you. And though... Maybe they've thought about the cross and the empty tomb as moronic. Lord, I pray that they would acknowledge it as their only way of being reconciled to a holy God. And thank you that the end of that road is eternal life. Father, I would pray for each one of us who would say that we know you. It's pretty easy to get caught up in following the so-called philosophies of this world. And Lord, I pray that we would not put our trust, our confidence in ideas that are impermanent, that are damning, that are powerless. Lord, I pray that we would be the kind of people, regardless of what those around us might say about it, I pray that we would be the kind of people who delight in following your word in the power of the resurrected Christ, believing that it's able to make wise the simple. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <coughs>